uh, right on time. So you have uh, four minutes or so to prepare your your setup yes. and to go live. We have some delay about 15 to 20 seconds between the the stage and the, the broadcast. Yeah, I, I saw that, yeah, when I turned on the, the public broadcast. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly to Regina's talking. Yeah. yeah. I put your presentation here. I don't know if you have small letters, but oh. if this is okay. Yeah, can you already see it? I shared it. So yes, yes, I think. Okay. Yeah, I can see it too. We are seeing cool. it. Right. I can see some blue elephants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had an artist at our company who was drawing some very cool images of uh, yeah, our services. We will see more of them in the in the whole presentation. It's really really cool. Yeah. So I, I think this switch between speakers is is quite fast. Maybe we can have more questions or try to answer more questions. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I thought about if people would raise um, their voice in the public chat and ask questions there. <laughs> yeah. If I have to we switch to the public one and then uh, listen to the, and then answer in this session, <laughs> but. If you are asking all the questions, then it's fine, yeah. Yes, but we have a lot of people participating. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing people are. Okay. Let's see. Oh, no, yes. I, I think I saw 1,600 people uh, before yeah, but... the session started. So yeah, they are moving the around. I think uh, yeah. Michael's calling you, Jorge. Oh, really? He said, George, question mark. <laughs> it is indeed much faster on the, <laughs> on this, uh, on this stage to change the, the presenters. <laughs> it's good, <laughs> good. So Felix, I, I will yes. leave now the, the, the stage and we yes. are, will be the, the only speaker now on in, okay. in three, two, one. So, all right. Um, hi, Phosphor G. Good to be back. Uh, it's been a while. I think, yeah, 2018 was the last time I joined. So, um, this talk is called Watch After Your Post Just Heard. And what is it about? Um, I want to explain to you how you can manage thousands of high available post just clusters and still get a good sleep at night. And I also want to speak a bit about my experience in developing database as a service tools, because maybe most of you are only seeing this from the user perspective, using some uh, cloud provider and using the database as a service there. But uh, when you are on the other side you and you have to think about, hmm, we want to provide as much automation and convenience as possible for the users, um, how can we do this? Uh, yeah, the target audience for this talk would be DBAs and software engineers, but everybody else, I hope you still get some inspiration from this talk. Hopefully it won't be too techy for you. Okay, so yeah, I'm Felix. I work at Salando as a database engineer since two and a half years. And in case you have not seen me at previous conferences and have not seen my previous talk, let me tell you that I like Phosphor G and um, the whole idea of open source in general. I joined uh, before I was working as a geospatial scientist. And uh, yeah, so, but my interest in Postgres and Post just got me into this DBA field. So um, in case you don't know Salando, uh, we aim to be Europe's starting point for fashion. So it started 2008 with selling shoes online, but now we sell like all different kinds of fashion and also beauty products in nearly every market in Europe. We are very, dynamic, diverse, and also very big company, very fast growing, I have to say. It's very different from what I've worked before. And um, at Salando, I joined Team ACID. By this acronym, you can already tell that we love uh, relation databases and Postgres in particular. 
Uh, we manage over 2,000 Postgres clusters in a distributed cloud environment at Zalando. Um, and in our case, it's uh, AWS where we run stuff on. And we also have our own team dedicated to run a, a Kubernetes environment on top of uh, AWS. And we provide database as a service tooling for over 100 teams. Of course, it was not always like this. We also started with on-premise data centers and everything was pretty static. And whenever teams needed something from the database team to create a new database cluster and change something, um, they had to file a ticket and DBA teams had to pick it up. It was very classical DBA job. Uh, so yeah, quite boring, maybe not that pleasant for both sides, for developers and DBAs. But then at some point, yeah, company was growing that fast that we had to think, okay, we need to find better ways to scale faster and easier. And we started moving databases to the cloud. And one requirement was to uh, put everything into Docker images. Maybe it was a bit controversial back then in 2015, but we started doing it anyway and run it in EC2 instances on AWS, which proved to be quite a nice experience. And so if you have not heard about this Docker image that we use, we called it Spilo, which is Gregorian for elephant. And this Spilo image usually includes the latest Postgres releases. So from now it's there is even in, in some branches, there's 14 in there and back to nine, five, I think at the moment. And we usually do this to onboard other customers easier when they come from another environment, maybe RDS and so on, and they want to switch to our tooling. Um, and they have an old version running, we just migrate them and then we can do the major version upgrade. Um, Spilo also comes with some useful preload libraries. So PG start statements, PG mon, if you know Postgres, probably you know what I'm talking about. And it also has a bunch of extensions and Postgres is one of them. So um, there's also timescale, PG partner and so on, some useful extensions that you might need. But the probably the most important and essential asset to the Spilo image is the Petroni high availability daemon. Uh, we came up with this because after moving to the cloud, I mean, in the cloud, you have lots of moving parts. Node can, nodes can go down at like any time. Of course, they run for some time, but you have to expect more failovers than uh, if you run stuff on bare metal in data centers. And so we come up with Petroni, which provides you automatic um, high availability for Postgres. It does the leader election. It checks all the instances. If there is a reachable and so on. So there, a lot of magic comes from Petroni, and it's becoming it has become one of our most successful open source projects. So very popular one used by lots of different companies. I think even IBM uses it for their cloud and offering, and banks use it. Broadcasting um, companies use it. So it's it's quite a huge success story for us for our team. Um, yeah, of course, we also ship backups to Amazon S3, to an S3 bucket with Wally. Uh, we also use it for um, restoring backups. And in case you want to configure this image to your environment, if you're not on AWS, but on Google Cloud Platform or Azure, there are lots of environment, environment variables that you can that allow you to configure it to your own custom setting. So um, this is how it goes nowadays with Docker images. There are just, everything can be configured with these variables. Okay, but still um, we had our clusters then running on AWS that was nice, but after like, if you pass the mark of 100 databases and yeah, and more and more teams joining and want to use Postgres, uh, you're drowning in all these requests. We thought, okay, we need some more automation to automate all the basic DBA tasks of setting up a new cluster and changing stuff and so on. And so back then there was an offering for on AWS called um, RDS, but we thought, okay, maybe we can uh, yeah, come up with our own solution around the Spilo image because um, RDS was lacking some features like the freshest versions of Postgres and uh, maybe also automatic failover wasn't, I'm not sure if it was available back then so we thought, okay, let's create something. Let's turn our whole team of DBAs uh, with operational workloads into a software engineering team with, and create tools that create this abstraction layer between our de developers and the whole database infrastructure. And we were looking for a framework to do this. And back then we also had our first deployments running in production on Kubernetes in 2016. 
so we thought okay let's uh, let's try try kubernetes with its extendable um api we can we might be able to create a database as a service offering on top of it and our goal was to stay as cloud native as possible to to leave as much automation that kubernetes already provides in deploying software um, leave that to kubernetes and don't reinvent it and whenever our components talk have to talk with each other talk via the um, like the service layer of kubernetes so to make sure that whenever we may change the cloud provider that this is easily doable we'll just have to switch them to another cloud of uh, kubernetes offering okay speaking about kubernetes in case you don't know it might be the case i mean nowadays it's quite popular what is it very very brief explanation i cannot be really go in depth here so it provides you building blocks to deploy and scale microservices that was the original idea and but it became so popular that people wanted to run just everything on kubernetes so and even yeah after some time it got very also a very good abstraction layer for persistent storage so description for storage classes volumes and so on so that make it possible to run stateful applications there like postgres and um, yeah and it also has a very pretty vibrant community with its own conferences and releases every few months so um, yeah it was a good decision for us back then to to move on onto this train but still you can also use everything which i show you you can also use on top of OpenShift, but um, yeah, it was originally developed for Kubernetes. So speaking about some building blocks, here you can see a couple of them, but um, that's of course quite a lot to digest. So you have pods, services, data sets, and so on. You cannot really give this to your to your engineers and say, yeah, this is everything you have to create to run Postgres on Kubernetes. What developers want is just one resource type. And fortunately, Kubernetes allows you to create your own custom types in our case, it's just a PostgreSQL type, which you can create. And then you can create custom controllers in Kubernetes, which then watch for these resources, pick them up and create all what's necessary in the background. So developers only have to think about write, writing um, one manifest file for the database cluster. And how can this database cluster look like? For example, like this, just a few lines. So those who are familiar with Kubernetes, uh, recognizes instantly, I would say, you have their kind of type PostgreSQL. This is our custom resource, which we created. And there you can specify, okay, I want to create a new cluster with three instances. That's one master, two replicas. We always have only one master and then asynchronous replication or synchronous if you want. And you can specify the major version, volume size and uh, team team ID, and that's mostly it. I mean, there are a few more fields you can specify, but this is the minimal version that gets you going and you submit it to uh, Kubernetes. And after one minute, you have a running cluster with high availability backups and so on. That's um, and pretty, pretty nice. So one thing that um, I see in some talks when we got asked about a Postgres operator is that people usually think that it does all the magic with high availability and so on um, and man Postgres management and so on. But the Postgres operator, this is really just um, there for high level tasks in um, on top of Postgres and Patroni. So uh, the magic happens in the in the Spilo image in Patroni and, and Postgres and operator in Kubernetes is only there to watch for new manifest created, update them, compare them with the existing state for example, you can um, update the major version in the manifest for maybe in some weeks from 13 to 14, and then the operator will just go to the database pods and then trigger the major version upgrade for you. So this is the like the abstraction and the amount of jobs it does. So it also has some nice features like it does rolling updates of pods a bit smarter than the actual stateful set. So it watches for no changes. So for example, every month, you have to, we have to rotate all the nodes with the newest software. And this will also rotate the pods and do a failover. And our operator will recognize when nodes will uh, marked as dec to be decommissioned and then move pods around so that you have less failovers. Uh, one nice asset is also cloning. So you can create a new cluster and say, okay, it's a clone of my existing cluster and maybe a clone from two hours ago. So in case you had like data loss or so on, you can just clone your cluster 
and do a recovery from any point in time you want. And um, yeah, you can also create standby clusters. It's also useful feature if you want to do migrations. What we have seen usually during Cyber Week, that's a, like one of the big events uh, at Zalando, of course, um, is that uh, yeah, services and apps scale out like crazy to lots of lots of pods. Then they are all connecting to a database and then easily hitting the connection maximum limit, even though they are using connect, um, application side connection pooler. But we thought, okay, let's let's create um, also database connection side pooler, and you can just go in the manifest, say, okay, enable connection pooling, and the operator will spin up a PG bouncer deployment for you. Um, you have seen in the manifest that there is also uh, the ability to provision users and databases. So um, that's then one part of the schema migration. The rest could, should come from tools like Flyway. Um, the good thing is in Kubernetes, when you create new users or also app users, it creates secrets for you that store the credentials. So you don't have to remember passwords anymore. So, and or change it via email and so on. It's all there in the, in the Kubernetes secret. You can just grab the credentials from there and then log into your database. And if you're really lazy in writing YAML code, you can even use a browser-based UI where you just have to fill out some fields and then a new cluster spins up. So maybe in the end, I have time to show it to you. Okay, speaking a bit about user experience. So you have, should have now understood that all the developers have to do to interact with the database infrastructure is this single manifest. So whenever they need to increase the volume, add more users, um, maybe add some configuration for Postgres, they do it all via this manifest. And so we have to always think about when we create a new feature, how can we make it as simple as possible? So for example, in our, we also have a documentation where we explain some best practices to our devs and then um, for example, one idea here is to, to have a, like a default user setup where you always have a reader role, a writer role, an owner role, and you can also in Postgres configure default access privileges. So when you create new tables, privileges are already in place, but that is something that the user has to set up on her, uh, on her own or his own. So um, we thought, okay, maybe we can make this easier and avoid that people have to specify all these roles in the manifest Maybe we can just, uh, you have to specify like uh, under a new key, a, a certain database that is then prepared with some um, default features like default roles and even extensions maybe, and uh, also schemas. And so this is how it now looks like that if people want to create a database, for example, with the Postgres extension, because you know sometimes when they run a flyway migration, create this Postgres, exten Postgres extension and only super users can do it. Um, then they might have to fiddle around with some uh, whitelisting extension that other users and super users can create this Postgres extension. But we thought, okay, it might be nice if the operator just does it for them. And so that, yeah, when they create new tables then all the privileges are in place, that's also pretty nice. So that's just one example of how this could look like if you have to create a new feature, how simple can it be? I mean, you see it's already a couple of fields, um, but yeah, at least it does also a lot of stuff for you. Okay, so um, speaking about monitoring, what do we use here? So whenever you create a new cluster, we also have a browser-based UI where people then see the currently running queries. So if there's some blocking query and so on, we also have an, uh, a library called bgmon, which exposes the background worker metrics of Postgres to a REST API that we can then grab to show the user's CPU consumption, memory consumption, and so on. What is also quite useful is uh, query statistics to show them, okay, what are your most slow running queries in, in your cluster? How is the data distribution? <clears throat> we can even show the users a history of like how a query behaved over time. So maybe at some point, suddenly the execution plan flipped and the query is taking much more time. And um, yeah, sometimes it's also interesting to show them who has logged into the cluster. So we created an extension there called PG Osman, where yeah, we track the all the logins of different users and application users, even maybe um, unexpected, unwishful logins. And of course, we also have alerting. So um, we have one central monitoring unit at uh, or framework at Salando, which we call Zmon, that is also open source, and this allows you pretty easily to send 
single SQL um, queries to all your clusters. So whenever you create a new cluster, Zmon already hooks in and um, we have a, then a dedicated role there that makes it easy then to create a new check in Zmon and say, okay, I want to send this query to all my clusters to maybe check if there has been no update base backup in the last night. That also happened at some, at some point. And so that's easy to, good to know that you can have a quick um, a disaster analysis when something goes wrong. Okay, so slowly coming to an end now. Um, what are some best practices that I've learned in the last two and a half years working with this setup? Um, and I can tell you that when you work with Kubernetes, you really uh, uh, yeah, obtain this microservice perspective uh, because of, yeah, because creating database clusters is so easy. I just, I only want to see one database in each Postgres cluster. So really a Postgres, did its own dedicated Postgres environment. Because then if something goes wrong, if your app crashes the cluster or just the pod goes down whatsoever, just one service, one application is affected and not like a whole fleet of services. So this is usually what I recommend to teams. And also they have to make sure that maybe yet that your, their databases don't grow enormously. So they should think about table partitioning early on when they see a table gets too big or even when a cluster gets too big, usually we do sharding, then we create separate Postgres clusters, and then we have the, the sharding logic in the application. Because when your cluster gets bigger and bigger and something crashes, which you have to expect on the cloud, then rebuilding a new instance, rebuilding uh, like the crashed replica takes more time. That's one example. Also something what I see in the environment, uh, in, the, in the community is that when people run our Postgres operator and they update to a new version and suddenly all the production databases have some problems. You should always do this in a, first in a dedicated test environment and not in your production, of course. I mean, even with cloning, it's, it's easy to just test things in production, like major version upgrades, for example, if your application is compatible. Okay, final slide. Um, some lessons um, we learned on developing database as a service tools. Mm -hmm. that when you create new features and you provide great flexibility of configuring your Postgres cluster, it will be abused. So we have one section where you can override single Postgres configuration parameters like shared buffers, workmem, and so on. And of course, if you can do it, some teams will do it and then they wonder why all of a sudden their pods die because of out of memory. So there's always this, mm, should we really open, give, uses the whole flexibility or not. Um, then there's also the question, should we, auto, should we use more auto scaling or less auto scaling? When we see, oh, this space is getting narrow, should the operator automatically increase the volume? It might be fine if like data grows steadily, but sometimes you might have a query that just writes lots of temporary files. And this fills up the disk space. Would you really want to increase then? Obviously not. So. Maybe your developers would like this if you auto scale everything, but your boss will, might not. If, um, yeah, we, see, we look at the bill at the end of the month. So uh, yeah, and one danger I always also see is um, we have this solution now, it's, it's open source, everybody can use it. People come along and see, oh, cool, it automates all the things. Nice, they start using it. And then the day will come with, when something crashes then you still should know where to look, where are the right, where are the locks, and you should know how to repair the stuff. So there is the danger of this autopilot effect. You should still know how to land the plane. There should still be someone in your company who is capable enough to know Postgres enough to um, fix the solution. And then last but not least, everything I've told you now sounds quite fancy, quite cool, but do you really need it? Do you really manage 100 or thousands Postgres cluster? Do you really need high availability? Then if not, yeah, then you might not need Patroni or operator, or you can go with another Postgres image. Um, but yeah, that's just what I wanted to tell you. So um, it makes management super easy. And sometimes when I work on private projects on my own laptop, I think about, uh, it's so pleasant to create a cluster in just one minute. But yeah, I mean, if you just have to manage one database, one cluster, you cannot do this without Kubernetes. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's about it. On the last slide, I have gathered some links. 
of the projects I've talked about, the extensions we created, um, and the tools we created, and yeah, happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Felix. It was a quite clear presentation, and uh, we have uh, some questions already. Uh, I've copied and pasted them on the chat, and the first one was about the the availability of the slides, but I think you already show the the links to your slides. Maybe you yeah, can show I will, it I again. I will make it available, yeah. Okay, of course. you can copy and paste. And uh, another question was about how do you manage the, the, the installation of the extensions? I saw in the YAML that you have uh, a list of extensions, but for example, the extension dependencies like GDAL, Proj, and so on. You install everything from packages? Yeah, we install from packages, yeah. We okay. don't uh, uh, yeah. deploy from source. We don't build it on our own. OK. And the, the, the third question do you have, you have there? If new databases are added, is the pooling dynamic? Mm, you mean if a database is added within the same container? Yes, um, I think so. Yes. And, and the question is... Uh, Patroni is, is there for like the whole environment for all databases. Yeah. It's, for, it's there for the whole cluster. I mean, you know, all your data, it doesn't matter where the database, if the database is created, it's yeah, in the same pod like all the others. So Petroni takes care only on the pod level on each instance. Okay. So let me check. Uh, we have uh, another question here from, from the audience. Um, <laughs> about the threshold for big tables to the partition, for example. Uh, uh, we usually tell our teams to, when you hit like the billion mark, yeah, and you and you know that your data grows quite steadily, then you should really do think about the right partitioning strategy. Yeah, we saw it for one team like a couple of weeks ago that um, we applied partitioning there. It's al always not that easy when you have a table already there to turn it into a partitioned one. But then all of a sudden they could take up 10 to 15 more requests per second. So it was definitely worth it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another question is, is quite, it's quite uh, interesting. Do you have any war stories about uh, Automation going wrong? So. Um, we have actually, yeah, there are some. Um, you can check out, there are some talks online available from somebody from our Kubernetes team who talked about what could go wrong in Kubernetes if you run stuff there. And we also have some talks about um, our experience from the last two years or now three years running Postgres in production on Kubernetes, what could what could go wrong. Good, so good. The whole talks only about that topic or like a big part of uh, the talk is about that topic. So check that out. It's, I think it should be a linked in our Postgres operator repository. Okay. And just uh, Kubernetes Salando and you will find it, yeah. Okay, have another question. How is the connection pooling is done? It's a bit with PG Bouncer. So you deploy and it's operator creates a deployment which spins up um, PG Bouncer pods and then you connect via the pods to the database. Okay. So not directly to the database pods, but via PG Bouncer. You always use PG Bouncer in, in front of the database. Uh, not always, you can switch it on or off. It's okay. usually at our teams um, have application side connection pooling that works fine, but sometimes, yeah, if you scale out pretty heavily, then it makes sense to enable database connection pooling. It's not enabled by default. Okay, Felix, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation and thank you You're for welcome. answering the, the questions. Uh, I think it was quite, quite interesting. <laughs> uh,
uh, a use case for just a, a few of uh, our users for working with Maybe, such yeah. <laughs> large environment. But it's it's good. It's good to know how how can this be automated as you show. So we are moving to our next presenter.